everybody, this is Cindy Allen, Editor-in-Chief of Interior Design. Today, you're going to be inspired and, well, rejuvenated by my conversation with our friends at Rejuvenation, a classic American lighting and house parts general store. Now, they have a saying, from the front porch to the back door, I love that, um, by providing lighting, hardware, bath hardware, and functional home goods based on the best of the past, but designed for today to last for years to come. I can't wait to share their story with everyone today. We're gonna see product and you're in for a treat because while we're talking, we'll be touring the factory in Portland, Oregon to follow the journey of light. So let's all imagine we're in Portland today. I am and meet my special guest. We have Evan Dublin, Vice President and Creative Director and Charlie Calvin, Vice President of Manufacturing and Engineering. Hi guys. Hi. Okay, let's get started. We have a lot to go through and I'm really excited. So I know you guys, I know there's a sense of history with the brand and a very strong message about being an American company. So can you tell us your story, who you are and what you do? Evan, let's start with you. Yeah, so um, the company started in 1977 as an architectural salvage and restoration business. Over the years, it evolved um, to be a period authentic reproductions company. And then in about 2011, William Sonoma purchased the brand and they introduced the concept to break from purity authentic. And over the years, it's been the evolution of landing our voice, but still holding on to all of the quality and pillars that started the company. And, and so I remember, I remember the like vintage uh, era, uh, which, I, which I also love. So was, was it an interesting or uh, like organic transition to start actually designing product? I think so. I think it was a build like over that whole time period. It was um, collecting interesting pieces, house parts, lighting, hardware. And they learned a lot from all of these uh, pieces that they were finding and selling and customers were coming back to them looking for specific functions and time periods. And so it built this wealth of knowledge focused on quality and function. And then, you know, it's evolved into now, how do we, uh, how do we put more of a modern spin onto that and have our own, and have our own voice? Yeah, you know, that's what, that is what's so interesting, right, today, like, if you look at, we have, we do research all the time. And if you look at traditional versus contemporary, it used to be completely reversed, right? Like everything was like more traditional and now everything is more contemporary. Um, so it's so great. I mean, you had the vintage thing, which we all love too. So you, you're kind of the best of both worlds right now, right? Yeah. And I think it's a balance. I think what makes the company so interesting is a balance of all of these different time periods. There's pieces that have been in our line for years and it's about how do we continue to grow those categories and balance out aesthetics and have it come through authentically. You know, I love um, the Joseph Frank uh, accidentism philosophy uh, of it's uh, collected and uh, grown over time. And so that, you know, we, we put that lens on whenever we're designing something new. Yeah. Now we're going to get more, Charlie, we're going to, we're going to talk to you about the whole engineering side, which is also super interesting, but I do want to know since you're together and I want to bring you into the conversation, how, how tricky, like, can you explain how tricky the engineering side of lighting actually is and how close you guys work together? Yeah, we have a very close knit product development team, which includes the designers, engineering, sourcing, and, uh, there's a lot of back and forth. I mean, Evan's team comes up with some really great looking stuff and <clears throat> it's never, we can't do it. It's just, you know, with enough time and money, we can do anything. However, um, you know, what's feasible for to meet our timelines and, and, you know, provide the value to our customers, you know, what they, what they're looking for. And so definitely there's, there's back and forth on every project. It's just a matter of how much compromise needs to make if it's within our wheelhouse or if it's something totally new, but yeah. being able to be flexible to, with the design is one of the reasons we keep this, this engineering and manufacturing in house. Okay, Evan, come on. All right, tell me the truth. <laughs> Does he go, no? <laughs> it's a balance, yeah. it's all a balance. It's just a matter of how long the project's gonna take, but we work through it. Yeah, all yeah. right, we're gonna get to more techie stuff um, in, in a bit. Um, Evan, how, how long have you been with the company? For about five years. Ah, 
Ah, so a lot of things have changed since then, right? Quite a bit, quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's really exciting. All right, so tell us about the evolution of, you know, going from uh, lighting to all other categories. Yeah, so we, um, we come through the lens each season from a project standpoint. So our customers come for us, come to us to renovate their kitchens or their bathrooms. And so it's, what are all the functional pieces that round out those rooms from all of the hardware to plumbing to the, all of the overhead lighting, but then also furniture and rugs and any, any of the essential layers that layer into those spaces. And then, you know, what makes the company so amazing and is the, um, what the team is able to do, making sure that all of the finishes match across all of the um, hardware and lighting and all of the components in the space. So the customer is able to mix and match and have it be perfectly aligned, which is awesome. Yeah, that's, that, that sort of kit of parts is actually a super advantage. And I know like when I go on to the site, cause I do, and I, I love seeing the little bars of the finishes, you know, and I'm always like checking it out. Um, yeah. So I think that's super smart. It must be really fun too, to be able to have that kind of range for, um, well, I think about the design community, like they must love the range. Yeah, and I mean, every project is a little bit different and depending on the customer or the environment, we're able to do anything from polished nickel to an unlacquered brass to oil rub bronze. And so, you know, you're able to put your point of view on it and as well as the customer. Yeah, no, that's great. And so when did they decide to go beyond lighting and hardware? I think they've been introducing these other categories for years. I think it started out as um, we had sold some furniture and other pieces um, in the early 2000s and even in the late 90s. But over the past five years, it's been a push to develop uh, our own line of furniture, um, as well as rugs and textiles. So it's been a build. Yeah. 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 Now I want to like um, Charlie when we when we talk about lighting, I mean that that's an in depth category, right? I mean so much has changed. Um, there are so many issues with uh, just lighting in general, right? And you do residential and commercial. So do you want to give us sort of a snapshot of what that looks like? Yeah, so we're, we're a UL certified factory. And so everything that we're shipping out of, you know, has the confidence behind the UL certification. Um, we have uh, many ADA compliant um, fixtures. We, we offer many dry, damp, wet rated. Yeah. That's all coming through here at the factory here. Mm. Um, there's more. Do you have also for, for the design community, they should know that you could do kind of custom anything, right? We, yeah, again, anything's, anything's possible. <laughs> yeah, we do, we, you know, our, our current offerings offer so much options because we're, uh, one of the reasons that we're doing the engineering is we're engineering um, a lot of co-use parts or parts that are used in our other fixtures so that we can offer, for instance, our hood, hood light, which is kind of a, a staple that we've had for many years. Uh, it's a pendant and, you can actually go on the website and select in one inch increments, 30 to 150 inch drop length. I mean, that's, that's pretty unique. And we will actually be cutting, cutting that um, to length specific to that order. And then of course there's the 12 or 12 foundational finishes and shades you could have in like with hood, there's like over 25 shade options. So all those options, usually there's enough flexibility in there that we don't have to do anything um, you know, cut truly custom, but we also do that when we when we have a customer approach us and say we really like this, but for this application, we don't want it a rotted pendant. We want a corded pendant. Can you do that? And so we'll have the engineers take a look at it. And as long as we're staying within our UL certification for that fixture, then um, we'll assess it and we'll give it a try. Okay, so Evan, let's get to some design goodies. All right. So uh, I know you have a new collection, the Ormandy collection. So why don't you, can you kind of explain like how, how it starts, how it originates and, and because the factory's right there, like kind of the process of making this um, collection? Yeah, so we land um, as a team, you know, there's multiple departments within and we decide that we need a new lighting collection to move through Nikolai and partnership. Um, 
So that sets us up on the track for development. But what the design team goes through is inspiration and research. Every year, there's a root of inspiration. Um, the year that we developed Ormandy, it was rooted in organic modernism mixed with brutalism. And so the team was exploring those concepts, finding designers for inspiration. And then we take that and we start to build what the, the shapes and what the forms start to look like. So this one, the goal was, how can we make a large low profile shade that pairs with our domestically made glass shades that are already run, running through Nikolai, which is the co-use component conversation, um, and get this almost like nestled glass shade up into a metal shade. And then I've been very focused on details and connections and captures. And so the, the amazing engineering feat of this one is that um, all of the detail that goes into capturing both shades. Is it is it sort of like an interesting like design uh, puzzle because you have so many parts like are there a certain amount of parts that you try to use in every new um, in every new collection like explain yeah. that to me. Yeah, it's a bit of both. The designers have a base knowledge of all of the parts, but it's really leveraging uh, Charlie and Charlie's team. So we'll start with a concept of where we think it should go aesthetically, generally work through the construction proportions, the detailing, and then that's when the conversation starts with engineering and they're saying, they say, oh, we already have components like this, can we substitute here? And then it's a compromise for the greater good and it also pushes the evolution of the design, which is also exciting. Um, okay, so Charlie, do you remember a couple of like kind of pivotal moments in uh, the, the making of Ormandy? Well, I think, you know, fortunately Ormandy is pretty well within our wheelhouse, it, you know, as far as the, the design aesthetics. And so the, the, the very large shades and getting them polished to mirror perfection you know, that was actually a challenge, but uh, we were able to accomplish it because again, we're doing it all right here and we can, we can, the person who's doing that polishing knows exactly what needs to take place. I understand, I understand that when you like go through the factory, it, it starts in the design library, right? So is that like the, the starting point of like inspiration for you get into the nuts and bolts, so to speak? Is that true? Yeah. So the design team will pull inspiration from that library. There's years of just collected books and knowledge within that space. So we take the, the concept and all of the research, market research that we're doing, and we try to find inspiration based on these old lighting catalogs. And so that kicks off the process. Yeah, so, and so Charlie, like take us through the process. So now you have to make, like you guys are in agreement, no more fighting. <laughs> you said, okay, we can make this. And so like, what happens? I want to try to like visualize how to make it. Yeah, so we'll, you know, we have a uh, warehouse full of our, what we call raw materials or components, parts and pieces. And because we're a build to order, we're not, we're, we're basically getting a, we could get an order for one item, two items, 50 items, 100 items. The uh, associates will walk through with that order and pick all the components. The components will then get passed to the finishing operations, which could be lacquer, polish, plating. Um, then there's, there's other uh, operations like uh, we have what we call antiquing, which is actually an oxidation or it's a kind of a, it, kind of a weathery look. Um, and then, then of course it goes through assembly where again, by hand, and this is all, we don't, we really don't have much automation in this factory. And again, it's because we're doing build to order and we have so many variety that there's not enough repetition for automation to be a value. So this is all working with their hands, finishing and assembling. And then we go through, finally, we'll go through the UL test to make sure hundred percent of these lights going out past the, the UL certification. Mm -hmm. And Evan, having the having the factory there, having the making part like right at your fingertips, like as a designer, like how useful is that? It's incredibly useful. Yeah. So while we're working through any of the designs, components are coming in. The engineers are going back from um, our design studio to the factory. We're able to manipulate some of the parts, make adjustments to general scale and proportions of things, and work through the designs until we're all happy. 
Yeah. So can you can you guys uh, each think while I'm, while the others talking about maybe like a a favorite or a really successful um, collection and and like a little bit of a story of the making of because I know that the designers really really these days they really want to know how how it was made. I got a favorite. It's also a newer collection called Jericho. Uh huh. Um, so the the concept was inspired by uh, Gunnar Asplund from Sweden, and we really loved this big, organic, almost mushroom-shaped glass. So then how do we turn that into our own language, evolve it um, based on all of some of the components that we're already using and come up with our own voice? Um, there is this balance of perfection with all of these machined metal components. And so what's interesting about the metal components on this collection is there's a texture to it. And so how do we create that texture? And then it's working with all of the vendors internationally to develop and evolve and land the perfect quality texture on these metal components and then juxtapose them against the you know perfect organic glass of the shade. So that was quite a bit of back and forth to get that new texture. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Do you was Charlie? Was that was that tricky? Do you remember that? That was a fun one. I mean, to develop yeah. a new finish, we have our tried and true finishes, but this was truly a a new finish where we wanted we wanted a certain look. And again, it was okay. Let's give it a try. And by by having the factory right here, we could go through and prototype and try. You know, tweak the machine a little bit to give it a little bit different, and then bring these and present these to the designers and say. Here, here's what our current operations can do. Does, it, does any of this match, you know, the the design intent that you had in mind? And then we narrowed in on one and and lock it in and go for it. So we talk about talk about that everything is is custom. Um, let's talk about lead times and and what what that really means. Yeah. So we have the advantage of because we have these the raw materials ready to go and we're doing the you know the, the finishing assembly and test and ship. You know, we're, we're currently, we quote two to five weeks um, to, your, to your doorstep is what our, our you know, standard lead time is. But we're, we're, typically, uh, we're typically, you know, beating that five weeks all the time. That's, that's it's, it's much quicker. So we're, we're definitely, we get the lead time through the factory is really a matter of days, depending on, obviously, depending on the, the light and depending on what has to go through it and the operations. But um, yeah, we're they, everything moves through really fast, and so we don't we don't we also I mean one of the advantages we don't have to we don't have to buy a bunch of inventory of every cent, every different iteration of light and finish that we want to offer. We're waiting until we get the order to put all of that in place. Which, if we had to get that from somewhere else, there we would have to buy loads and loads full of product. We'd rather wait until the customer orders it and make it. Right, you know. We, we do a lot of research and um, I hear over and over again from big design firms and what they're saying now because of COVID uh, and a, a, good, a good friend, uh, Margaret McMahon, she's big in, at Wimberley Interiors. And she said, what, we, what we've decided now is that we want a sustainable product that's locally sourced, um, and that this is big hospitality. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. that's a game. That's a game changer. It sits right in your wheelhouse. And what they also say they want, they want you to help them tell that story to their client. Right? That's what they need. They need you to to help them. So, um, what kind of story, um, Evan? Give us like what kind of story would you say about rejuvenation? Yeah, I think it's rooted in quality. I think that the level of detailing and manufacturing that we get into with all of these pieces, they're made to last and they're made to last not, not only um, uh, the everyday and functionally, but also aesthetically. They're, they're timeless, they're not trend based. And so they'll live forever in residential or trade environments. Yeah, nice, nice. Charlie, um, I was gonna ask you for your favorite. Do you have, did you have a favorite? Oh, I'd say my favorite is the Rigdon, um, and I, it'd be the, you know, the whole collection of our Rigdon light, and of course we have matching hardware to go with it, but the, uh, and speaking of, you know, challenges, there's a certain aspect, a feature on the, on, in the Rigdon, which is a, a coin cylinder that really, 
it's throughout the product. And to, to make that uh, and to match it and, and everything just has to, all those little teeth have to be just right. That was a challenge, but uh, the team was able to accomplish it and it really isn't an issue anymore. We're, we're just continuing. I, I, I knew you'd pick one that was like a complicated thing that you had to like figure out, which is- Sure, which yeah, we're fantastic. proud of it, yeah. Yeah, what, what was, what, tell me you guys, what was like one of the original favorites that then all of the other, like at, at least you say that things are, are developed on top of this idea of being able to use the different parts. Uh, give us a little history of that. So when talking about co-use parts, it really yeah. comes down to, um, the canopy, so the way that the it mounts to the ceiling, all of the drop rods. Uh, Charlie was talking earlier that we do custom drop lengths, and so all of those extrusion uh, come through the factory, and the, uh, those are co-used across multiple lighting collections. Mm -hmm. And then you get into socket cups and fitters, and all of these um, set screws and fitter yeah. screws, and all of that. And then we design all the components around that. Um, and so it's really all of the the details and the the mast pieces, but then there are unique parts that we add to each lighting collection. You know, in that in that way, I always I'm also thinking that it's very sustainable because you don't have the kind of waste because you're using a certain amount of kit of parts, um, which I think is really interesting and and also a good story for the design community to know about. Uh, Charlie, tell us, can you give us like um, I'd love to get a few steps of we're making a product, right? So you're going in and like, what machine, what's happening? What does it sound like? Yeah, so, you know, as we're picking through the warehouse and picking the parts to kit up, kit up the light, the job. So that individual job is gonna go through on a cart through its journey through the factory. And the first, the first stop is gonna be in, depending on the finish, but it could be the polish operation. And the polishing operation, it's a lot of work. With our, our associates are leaning in, holding them by hand and, and watching every square inch of that product to make sure it's just right. Um, then there's the antiquing process where we're dipping it into a, to a, a process that brings it out and really looks like an accelerated weathering to get that kind of you know, old look. Uh, or it could be we have, uh, it could move on to our lacquer spray application where again we have an associate suited up and ready to go and as the we actually have a conveyor that comes through and every job he knows to spray a certain finish on this this group of parts and then once once they're all dried and ready to go they come into assembly and assembly puts them all together and wires it up and make sure everything is tight and they're and they do a little final inspection to make sure that they're everything is perfect from a finish perspective and then the last step is our UL test to verify the circuitry is, is sound. Uh, and then it's just a matter of bagging it, boxing it and shipping it directly to the customer. Wow, there you go. <laughs> you know, I, I love, Evan, I wanted, to, I meant to mention to you before that I love that, like the, the color range that you're doing when you were talking about lacquering, Charlie. And so how are you, are, do you continue to develop like new colors for the lines? Yeah, we do. Every year we have one or two new colors that are based on trend forecasting and where we see the market going. Um, the team builds a palette and this ties to textiles and other um, functions within within the brand as well. And so that it all connects. So our color stories are cohesive across across categories. Yeah, I saw I saw like a beautiful and kind of interesting blue, um, of course, gray. But what, what's your favorite? What's your favorite color? So Thunder Blue is a favorite, of course. Yeah. Uh -huh. blue. Um, uh -huh. But also Sage Green. We've been mm -hmm. seeing a lot of this yeah. almost grayish sage color coming through with interiors and exteriors. So that's another another new fave. Yeah. No, that's so it's so fun. And it I mean, what what I see when I look look on the website, I see that if I'm a designer, oh, the possibilities are kind of endless, right? And mm -hmm. You're not that far away from me either. So like maybe I can get my hands on the things I need or have you develop the things or or do some custom because designers love that too. <laughs> yeah, come by and we'll talk about your space and what looks right for that environment and what shade works perfectly for, for that space and the, the fixture that you're interested in. 
Yeah, Charlie, what's what's the most interesting um, problem for you to have to tackle these days? Um, well, obviously, COVID has been a challenge. Um, we, you know, the beginning of the year, our, you know, we have a factory, we have 130 employees in our factory that as they're seeing the news comes through and we had to really navigate that and put in the, the appropriate safety protocols and get everybody back on the job. And, and we're really, it's kind of become, you know, just the every day now we, you know, with all, all of those. Um, so really that is, that's been our biggest challenge recently. And again, we can't just bring in anybody with no experience. This, these, these operations that are processed by hand takes, take years of, of, of experience and knowledge on how to get them just right. So, you know, getting the right workforce and bringing the team that we can trust is, is, is an absolute requirement. Yeah, and Evan, um, you know, I've heard it time and time again from the design community, just, you know, you know, missing that kind of collaborative environment. You know, there's a lot of things you can do from home, but there's some things that you want to do together. How has it been for your team? Uh, it's a been it's been a bit of a challenge. We do set time to come in and work through things within the studio space, and it's all you know. We need to see everything printed out, all the drawings one to one, make sure that everything's landing for scale. But it's a lot of just Zoom calls, a lot of drawing and holding up ideas that we're working through, share screens, and um, so we're finding ways to collab still collaborate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know, I know it. I know it can be tough. All right, so one final question. Since you do, a, there's a lot, there's a lot to rejuvenation and, and you, like you said, it keeps growing. What's, what's one thing the designer should know that they, they might not know about uh, rejuvenation? That um, we have everything that you need to complete a project within these spaces. And to, to your point, like we're continuing to fill all of the needs within those spaces. So come back and, and look to us. You know, if you're working on a bathroom or a kitchen, come back and look for those other layers that add, add on and complete that project. Mm. Charlie, one last comment. Well, I think most, you know, most people that think about rejuvenation don't know how much commercial business that we do. So we're, we're dealing with onesie twosies and then sometimes we're dealing with businesses that need Right. Um, lighting throughout uh, either a commercial business or um, or a restaurant, you know, any any type of you know atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want the designers to know that that on the commercial in the commercial sphere, uh, there's a there's a great way to partner together, and you have such a breadth of uh, product, which is which is amazing. Okay, I know we weren't able to really do the factory tour together, but I kind of feel like we did. And I am feeling rejuvenated with my friends at Rejuvenation. <clears throat> and I wanna thank you guys so much. Keep up the good work. There's positivity all around you. And uh, thanks so much for the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the time. Thanks a lot, Cindy. <laughs> it's great to see you guys. Yeah, good to see you. Hey design friends, this is Editor-in-Chief Cindy Allen here, AKA Cindy with a C. But today, I want you to give me a B. Give me an I. Give me a G. Oh yes, our big April issue is all about the next big ideas. Spanning every segment from commercial, residential, hospitality, health and wellness, and more. Our design giants, like Lois Goodall from CBT, agrees. She says, new ideas are flourishing to address the seismic shift in our culture. We're drawing on cross-disciplinary design to reimagine solutions for our clients. Like workplace is informing multifamily residential, hospitality is influencing the workplace, and biophilic design is benefiting all. So now let's talk about all those big ideas. For safety, how about touchless elevator buttons that look like magic, but are kinetic, and face masks that are all about protection and celebration. For climate change, smarter greenhouses are integrating technology to simplify crop planting. And our mental health mega matters with the Ohana Center for Health by MBBJ, 
which offers inpatient, outpatient, and community care for kids. All in all, our big ideas feature 11 countries. Wowza. We also talk top kitchen and bath trends and feature a special carpet flooring tile and stone section that will leave you, well, floored. The April issue tells us everything you need to know. Right now, the world needs innovation to get us to the other side. And this idea packed issue is one more tool that will move us ahead. It's all here and you should be too. See ya. I'm Jennifer Pfaff Smith, and I'm the Miami and Palm Beach Homes Editor at Lux Interiors and Design. A few months ago, we had the honor of featuring an amazing Miami residence on the cover of our September October edition. The house is a modern structure on the water and coral gables, and the interior has a really warm mix of contemporary art deco and global pieces. So I'm here today to take a deeper dive into the story behind this project. And here to help me is the designer of this residence, Mr. Robert Rianda. Robert, thank you for joining me. Hi, Jen. Great to see you. Great to see you too. <laughs> so I want to start by talking about the built environment you had here for this house. So it's a very unique structure. It reads very modern, but there's also some Asian influence as well. So tell us about the architecture setting you were working in. So what was really great about working on this house, we came into it while it was being built, probably still two years before completion, only the shell had been done. And a lot of the modern houses we work on in Miami are basically the typical white boxes with a lot of glass, very few details. And in my opinion, uh, kind of cold. I mean, they can be great for sort of a gallery feel or whatever, but um, to me, I always prefer a little bit more warmth and mix of materials. What was great about this one, it's definitely boxy. It's, it's a series of rectilinear planes intersecting, big glass windows, but it's much more of an organic approach. And basically what they did was they mixed a lot of materials. Uh, there's a lot of coral stone on the exterior for pathways, walls, staircases. Um, there's a great fire pit made of coral stone. And then inside the house, a lot of wood, as you can see right behind you, there are these giant wood walls that close off and want privacy. So there's this warm walnut, coral stone. And then probably my favorite feature of the house is on the exterior upper floor. It's uh, musharabi, which are basically wooden screens and they wrap around the whole upper floor and really filter in beautiful light during the day. And at night, they look like, um, it's I've described it before as a Japanese lantern. The house looks like it's this illuminated Japanese lantern. Um, what was really neat about the Musharabi, which as you say, is an Asian influence, but also a Brazilian modernist influence, um, is that we decided to use natural wood, uh, real wood. A lot of people in Miami, you know, everything in Miami when I work on projects, every, everyone wants everything looking brand new forever. So, for example, we don't often specify teak furniture for decks because clients don't like the way it ages and weathers and silvers. In this case, uh, we made a decision. We were going to use fake wood. And the owner is like, no, I'm from the Northeast. I'm used to Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard and the Hamptons. He spent every summer in the Hamptons and he's, he's used to that silvery weathered look. So over time it has weathered and it's weathered beautifully. It makes the house look a lot more organic and, and just natural. So I really love the, the Musharabi screens. Mm -hmm. um, architecturally, you know, the house has 13 foot ceilings on, on the ground floor, which is probably one or two feet more than a very high ceiling already. A lot of the houses we do are 11 or 12. So that extra 13 foot, you really feel it when you walk in, just the volume is huge. Um, scared me a little bit just because of all the open rooms and the large volume, like that's a very voluminous room behind you. So furnishing it and making it work with all the windows and the outside and everything was uh, something we really had to think about. So it sounds like this, this project was a little different for you um, in terms of a different type of contemporary. So how did the architecture influence your plan for the interior design? 
Well, going back to um, the organic approach I meant to the architecture, uh, we sort of took an organic approach inside. And um, I mean that like literally and figuratively, literally. Uh, we went for a lot of natural materials, very textured fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to keep, as you can see behind you, I tried to keep uh, most of the fabrics uh, in the light neutral tones so they wouldn't distract from the exterior. There's a lot of beautiful views of water, green, palm, sky. So I really didn't want the focus taken away from that. We kept a very neutral palette. And the only real punches are from the art. We have a lot of colorful art. Um, also organic in the sense of the way the project was put together, shopped and organized. We had a client who was super organic about the whole process and really just kind of let things flow into each other. This is not a project where I planned every piece of furniture from the get-go. Many clients want, they want, they want to know every piece of furniture before they pull the trigger on everything. Here, we really went just, we fall in love with something. Is this going to work? Is the size right for our plan? Sure, it's going to fit. Then later on, we got to make sure the other pieces work with it. But it was, it was a very organic approach in that sense. Um, but really the materials we use, you know, just a lot of um, textures for fabrics, some patina metals throughout the house, brasses, all of that just kind of worked with the, uh, with the organic approach to the exterior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love how you're, you're talking about it almost seemed instinctual the way you, you approach this project and, and the, the client um, sounds like he's very involved as well and this is really a passion project for him. So he, I, I understand, you know, had a, a lot of, he favors a lot of different design styles. There's modernism and art deco and tribal. So there's a lot of influence here. And conceptually, how do you approach a project like that when you want to get his vision just right, but you want to make sure it's all cohesive as well? What, what was your strategy? Well, the way it started, as you mentioned, uh, the client was super passionate about this and design. He retired, uh, left New York and came down to South Florida. This really was his dream house. And uh, before he even consulted with architects, he had really sketched out the layout of his dream house. Every single room was going to have a purpose. Uh, every area of the house was going to be a destination, whether it was swimming or the fire pit or lounging or hammocks. Um, so he really knew what he wanted. Uh, he also knew what he liked as far as furniture didn't necessarily know how to put it all together, but yeah. I've never seen uh, such organization with first dibs folders, for example. He would oh, want wow. first dibs and create, you know, glassware, sofas, uh, Murano, whatever. He just had a million categories. I wish my office was as organized as this one <laughs> because it was really, it was a treat, but it was also a little bit overwhelming because as you said, there are so many different styles and I was like, wow, how are we going to merge all this together and make it work? Is the tribal going to be 70% or is it going to be a couple of accents at 2%? Right. So again, it, um, there were a lot of early shopping trips with the client. And I think just a few trips made it really helpful to see things he really gravitated towards. I think Art Deco and Mid-Century were, uh, were the front runners. So I knew that my main pieces, you know, uh, important tables, dining tables, light fixtures would have to be from those periods. And then other things like glass and tribal, you know, those became more about accessories and art features in the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But again, it was super organic. It was just like running around and, and seeing things and figuring out, you know, what wall could this fit on? What room could this fit in? And, and just uh, some things we actually even bought and they were destined for other rooms. And then we decided to put them in a different location that had been planned. So things got moved around a little bit near the end phase. Sometimes you don't know until you're actually there at the finish line and you need to make, make a change. So yeah, absolutely. And some clients are really rigid about that and they don't like to do that. You know, you told me this $10,000 table was going to go right here. Um, right. This client was the opposite. He's like, just whatever looks great. Let's make it look, look let's make it work. And wow. Put it where it needs to go. Yeah. I love that flexibility. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like working for myself. I mean, when I've done at home, it's, it's evolved over years. Here, of course, we had a time frame. Uh, it wasn't bad. We had a couple of years, yeah. but you know, for myself, I will collect things over the years and find a spot for them. And you know, in my opinion, the, the greatest homes and the most interesting homes are those that feel collected and uh, and gathered over time. Absolutely. Well, the furnishings here, they're really varied in terms of era and origin and material, like you were talking about. And, and you told us in the article that this, you know, finding all these pieces was like going on a treasure hunt. And the project was all about discovery. And that, that seems to be a running theme here of what, of what you keep talking about with how it all came together. But, but really, what was your attack plan? And how did you go about finding the right pieces? 
Well, we, uh, a couple of ways. I did a lot of uh, trips with the client, day trips in Miami, uh, West Palm Beach, Palm Beach. Uh, we also went up to Hamptons, New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. So we traveled around a little bit and uh, he loved coming around. I mean, most clients max out after two or three hours at showrooms and galleries. <laughs> He, you know, I would max out after eight and he was ready to keep going. So wow. um, having that constant, you know, back and forth with him and dialogue and expedition and discovery was definitely a part of it. And then in my office, we also love to source things that are uh, secondhand antiques, vintage. So we use a lot of search engines like First Dibs and InCollect and, uh, mm -hmm. and others like that, auctions um, and finding things that are in Europe. We found quite a bit of this house from Europe. A lot of things came from Italy. So um, we shipped a lot and a lot of it was unseen. You know, we, we saw a lot while we were out shopping, but we ordered a lot of things from overseas. And if necessary, we would restore them. But, um, you know, one of the greatest things about a savvy client like this is he understands that vintage patina can look nice. It doesn't have to look kind of like the Musharabi screens I mentioned earlier. You know, the weather aged look is actually part of the beauty. Mm -hmm. It gives the character, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, definitely. So another big storyline here, of course, is this amazing art collection that the house has. And you curated the collection. And, and I, I know there were some special pieces as well from the owner throughout the home. Like there are these amazing Moroccan wedding veils in the staircase. So what was your process here for locating the right artwork and stuff that seemed really personal to him as well? Sure. So the art searching, uh, I would say it started casually from the get-go. Again, he had a million folders showing types of things that he liked and they were all over the map. So this wasn't about putting together a specific collection of one genre or period or artist. It was really about finding things that he loved and obviously fit the walls and the spaces. So we were looking around, uh, we would go to shows, Art Basel, we would, you know, Scope, all the shows that come down here, that used to come down here in Miami and a lot online as well. Um, going back to your discovery and expedition, the Moroccan wedding veils was probably the best example. I was in uh, Marrakesh for my 50th birthday a couple of years ago, and uh, I saw these wedding veils and they were beautiful and they were from a certain part of the country. And the, uh, the, the dealer only had four of them. And I started thinking, where can we use these? Well, we have a big double height staircase, floating staircase at the uh, entry gallery of the house and had been, I wouldn't say running out of ideas, but we were having too many ideas for that space. We thought about a hanging mobile, we thought about a series of paintings, just a lot of things. Most of it was three dimensional, however. I saw these wedding veils and I thought, wow, wouldn't these be cool? You know, the owner loves uh, tribal art, he loves African art, so we can come up with a neat way to frame these and sort of stack them up one on top of the other. So that's exactly what we did. We, um, we put them in loose site boxes, on a linen backing and uh, stack them up and they fit perfectly. I think they left maybe 12 inches up top and 24 inches down at the bottom. So it really is like a, a punch of uh, wow. texture and color and good story and um, yeah. heritage traditions. It's, it's a great installation. It's a serendipity moment too. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I was running out of ideas and also, you know, something that big is can get very expensive. Uh, obviously when you're shopping, uh, for textiles in Africa, prices are going to be lower than here. Yeah, so yeah. that was really great. And we found a great guy in, uh, in, in Morocco who helped facilitate all this and a few other things as well. Nice. And then some of the other pieces were just here and there. We commissioned the one in the foyer. That's a really special piece, um, which was the cover of the uh, September, October issue. Uh, that's a great piece by a Cuban artist down here, Anna Portuondo. And she happens to be the architect's wife. So it was really cool to include her in the project as well, because we've all become friends. I've worked with the architect quite a bit, but the owner uh, goes back with the architect as well and has become very friendly with the family. So, you know, having a little bit of collaboration from everybody and their extended families was a nice, uh, nice addition. Of course, a great team just makes the whole project even better. That's for sure. So with all these different furnishings and artwork you had to find for this house, I'm going to pose the chicken or the egg question to you. So, so when you approach these different rooms, what comes first, the furniture or the artwork? And, and were there any pieces that you really designed the whole space around this one piece, whether it was a furnishing or an artwork? Yeah, it's a pretty easy answer. No, um, when it comes <laughs> to furnishings, as I mentioned before, sometimes we would just, uh, you know, buy things and figure out where they go. We had a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't say there was any one furnishing that really dictated the rest of the pieces in that room. 
And art certainly didn't dictate anything either. The art all came later in the process. We had pretty much decided most of the furniture and, uh, and then we found these pieces and, um, and found the locations for them. And even things like throw pillows and accessories, which always come at the end of a project for me, we didn't try. I'm not one of those decorators who tries to match the blue from the painting on the throw pillow. I know it really works sometimes. And it's not that I haven't done it, but this was not a project where we did that. So uh, everything, again, was super organic and just kind of put together and um, roll the dice and it worked <laughs> out. <laughs> How fun to have such an organized client, but who's also so instinctual at the yeah. same time. Yeah, That's definitely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and whimsical and adventurous and all those things yeah. that make a project better. Yeah. So for this home, the, the owner you mentioned wanted to have, you know, every space kind of be its own destination and, and really its own purpose and reason for being there. So every space gets used and used in a different way. So let's, let's walk through some of these spaces here. So let's start with the foyer. I love this space and it seems to really set the tone. It has sort of like a warm gallery feel. Is that where you were going for? Definitely. It's, um, you know, you, there really isn't any furniture in the room other than one bench and one console table at the entrance. And a bench is a typical thing you see in a gallery. Uh, it's, it's that tall ceiling down there at 13 feet. And there's sort of a kind of an industrial staircase. It's concrete on the underside, wood treads and risers, and then a uh, cable rail. So that has a little bit of an industrial gallery feel as well. But we definitely wanted to walk in and feel drama right away. So between the huge expanse of floor to ceiling windows and the big wood panel walls in front of you with the artwork, the floating staircase. Um, it was aimed at that, you know, having a big impact and definitely more of a gallery feel. Yeah, yeah. Now there's also a sitting area by the fireplace. Uh, it's on one side of the main living area and it's it's my lovely background here. <laughs> right, yeah. So the forms here of, this, of the furnishings, uh, they're, they're very curved, there's rounded shapes. Tell us about the concept here. Yeah, so when you walk in the foyer, the room behind you is the first room you see entering the house. And you know, the house is so imposing in a good way for its geometry and its, and its sharp angles and its hard materials, concrete glass. So I felt when I walked in, uh, the immediate first thing I wanted to see was something to soften that. And I felt that the way to do that was with, like you say, a lot of curves, and organic shapes. We have a coffee table there, a Laverne coffee table, which is uh, a very sort of curvy organic top. And then the Platner chair behind you is also a classic. Um, the sofa is kind of a modern take on the Chesterfield, sort of like a, mm -hmm. I call it like a rock and roll Chesterfield, much more modern. And um, that seemed to work as well. So it was, it was definitely on purpose. We wanted things to be more soft and curvy and juxtaposing the, uh, the hard angles in the architecture. It's a nice plan opposites that, you, that you're pointing out, the, the rounded versus, you know, in this sort of rectilinear space as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things just happen by accident. For example, that artwork behind you is a bunch of circles. I won't tell you I was thinking more circles there, but it seemed to go with that thing <laughs> as well. Hey, it works. Yeah. <laughs> so the dining area also has a couple major wow factors. There's this really cool vintage chandelier. And then in the corner, there's this really tall Jack Fruitwood sculpture. And in our photo, of course, we also have this adorable dog who's yeah. stealing the spotlight. <laughs> Always does. Yeah. So how did you design this space? Um, so it connects with the living area, which is right next to it, but it still needs to be separate and it needs to be defined find as well. What was your approach? Yeah, so this is what I mentioned earlier. When you walk in that room, uh, it's quite a huge volume, especially that area stretching from the TV living area into the dining room. Um, so we needed to create uh, some definition between the two rooms. We just used a, uh, a long console we ordered from Europe, a Danish mid-century piece, and then put these two really funky lamps on there, these two mid-century uh, gold bubbly lamps by Sonnemann. Uh, we found those in Palm Springs and they definitely have that Palm Springs feeling. So they're very tall and they're very sculptural and uh, sort of like focal points. So those with the console divide the two areas. And then also uh, just to find a chandelier that really would work in this massive volume, um, we came across, I think it was the very first thing we purchased in Palm Beach, in West Palm Beach. Uh, it's like a 47 inch diameter Sputnik vintage chandelier. So 
Uh, and I was sweating that one out till the end. I was like, it's too big, it's too small, it's too big, it's too small. So I was like, I was going crazy until they hung it. And, you know, the owner, again, is totally mellow. He's like, it's going to work, don't worry. And uh, we didn't mock it up. In some projects, we mock things up when I'm really anxious about it. Here we didn't because it's not that kind of owner. So um, we put it up and it really, you know, it, it, it did its duty. It really stands up to the volume and grounds the dining space. And uh, also we didn't uh, use one long typical dining table. Uh, the owner uh, lives there alone with his partner. So at times it's just the two of them having dinner or breakfast. And uh, what we did was we used two big square 66 inch tables instead. And rather than push them together, we have about a foot separation between them. And one of them we organized kind of like a library table with books and sculptures and flowers so that it just, it looks like a more uh, homey accessory display. And, uh, and then they sit at the other table. They have a larger dinner party that can push them together and, and seat 14 people. Right, right. Well, that's another smart step that makes it really usable for the owners, no matter how many people are there. So upstairs, there's a living area and there's an office space where I would, I would love to be working from home there these days. <laughs> Tell us about the strategy for this room. So that room is immediately, when you get up the stairs, there are uh, four bedrooms, three guest rooms and three ensuite guest rooms and then the master bedroom. And that is sort of like a, uh, I wouldn't call it a hallway, but it's, it's quite a wide, almost like a corridor type space that connects all these rooms but it was designed wide enough so that it could be like a morning room when there are guests to watch TV or nighttime if they want to chill there, have tea, watch a little TV before they retreat to their bedrooms right behind it. So it was meant to be a little TV sitting area and also a desk if the guest has a laptop or something and they want to pop it because it also gets great light. And there's a whole wall of Musharabi screen in front of it outside the window. So during the day you have this beautiful filtered light and uh, at night, there's privacy through the screen. So it was really meant to, uh, to, to be a, a room for guests, not so much for the owner. It was a place for the guests to hang out when they're staying there. And he does have frequent guests. Um, as far as the color and the style of the room, this is one area where we did use more punches of color. I think it's the only fabric other than outdoor that is a bright, saturated color. There's an orange chair in there. Uh, again, some souvenirs from my Morocco trip. We have some uh, Moroccan pillows. Uh, Moroccan leather proof under the coffee table, and then a couple of photographs by the client's uh, daughter. She's a fine art photographer. Those hang over the sofa. So um, we definitely played with uh, more of the tribal uh, art and textures and, and furnishings up in this room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big your... African, or sorry, there's a big African piece behind the desk as well on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what's your favorite room in the house and why? I think the living room, the one right behind you, the sitting room, uh, you know, the room serves, you can see the desk over by the window. Uh, this is where the owner likes to work and trade during the day and have a more formal sitting area for parties. Uh, I think it's my favorite just because of the mix of styles and periods and shapes and, uh, you know, nothing is really from the exact same periods and similar periods, but we have Art Deco in there, we have Century. We have a couple of contemporary seating pieces and modern art, of course, Murano lamps. So I just really like uh, the coffee tables. One of my favorite furniture designers, uh, Kevin Laverne from the mid-century period. So I just, I guess my favorite furnishings are in that room. And the yeah. way they all sort of cohabitate is something yeah. great. Yeah, each piece kind of stands out on its own and sings. So were there any um, parts of this project that, that were coming together that maybe didn't work out? So like you mentioned, the, the dining room chandelier was a moment where you hung it and you didn't know if it was going to work, but it did. But were there any projects like that, any parts of it that, oh, it didn't work and we have to, we have to scrap it and move it around or find something else? Gosh, um, there usually are, but I can't think of any. That's good. <laughs> um, you know, well, yeah, part of it is working with such a great team. You know, the architect yeah. and contractor are both um, people I've worked with before and yeah. they're just exceptional. The contractor knows how to solve everything. Um, you know, there was a little bit of a glitch in the billiard room where we have, uh, we took a couple of Gracie wallpaper Japanese panels mm. and made, um, we made like a, uh, uh, a sliding art mechanism that would cover the TV. The owner didn't want to see that. Mm. So there were a couple of glitches in putting that together and fabricating that and you know, getting the TV right and whatnot, but it, it resolved itself. Yeah, well, there are always challenges, that's for sure. Yeah. So how does this residence compare to others that you've worked on? 
Uh, I would say, um, you know, we, we kind of do everything as far as styles. We work, on, especially with this architect, we do a ton of uh, traditional homes. Um, there's a lot of Mediterranean, sort of Hamptons classics, different Palm Beach look. So most of the projects we work on with them are very traditional. And, uh, and even the builder, when we build with him uh, on these other houses, uh, now he's experienced the builder in contemporary houses as well, as well. But the architect, I think this was his first major modern project. And, uh, and it was very influenced by a lot of history and Lise van der Rohe and modernism. Um, but I would say it was different in the sense that uh, just the approach to it and you know, the way the client was so um, fluid and involved and hyper-organized all at the same time. Um, unlike most of our projects, not that we don't have those, but this was a particular, uh, particularly savvy client, an open-minded client, an adventurous client, and um, just made for a great result. You know? Yeah, it sounds like a great collaboration. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm sure every project you work on leaves you with something that you learned. What was that here? Uh, just following on what I just said, uh, don't resist a client who wants to be really involved. Um, I know to a lot of designers, it can be a headache and a nightmare to have a client calling you every day and trying to solve problems on their own and whatnot. Um, this was a client who everything from value engineering with the architect and contractor to shopping with me, his, uh, his, his checklists, his Excel sheets, everything, his numbers was just, uh, super, super helpful. At first I was like, wow, this is just going to create a lot more work and time for me. Um, and he'll hear this, he'll hear me say that. Uh, at first <laughs> I was afraid of it and resistant to it, but at the end of the day, I feel like his contribution um, really, really improved the final result. And so I will never say no to a client who is uh, that passionate and that uh, desiring of uh, being involved in project and mm -hmm. tasks over. I mean, when there were little problems, he would, he'd get on the phone sometimes and call subcontractors and troubleshoot and say, I know you're busy, Robert or Joe or Ralph, let me handle this. And he would come up with solutions. So mm -hmm. don't ever underestimate your client. I guess it's the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Good lesson. Well, I mean, the end result was amazing. We were so honored to publish it. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for publishing it. I really was um, super happy, especially getting a cover. It was a great surprise. Mm -hmm. And a cover that had the uh, architect's wife's artwork in it, plus his work, plus my work. It was like a real cause for celebration for us to see that. So thank you. Of course, our pleasure. Well, this is all the time we had today. Robert, thank you so much for walking thank through you, this Jen. project with me. And we can't wait to see more from you. Definitely. I can't wait to show you. Thanks a lot. And have a great Thanks week. Thanks so much, Robert. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.